Um, we have apologies from Tracy Bradshaw, Aidan Parsons, David Carpenter, Aaron Sayagarajan, Chris Ketley, and to note that Merrick Vevers will be joining us slightly later at around 5.15. And also that we have um, no representation at today's meeting um, from Walking and Runnymede Borough Councils um, because both appointed governors um, um, have either stepped down or not been re-elected. However, we have had confirmation today from Walking Borough Council that Councillor Ellen Nicholson will be joining us as our appointed governor for walking and hopefully she'll be joining us from the next meeting. Thank you. And we 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 await Runnymede's uh, decision. We do. we do. OK, thank you. And of course, apologies from Anu. Uh, as I said earlier, those of you who weren't on, uh, Anu has uh, unfortunately had a fall and injured herself, so she's going to be off for the next six to eight weeks and uh, we wish her well. OK, so uh, let's have any declarations of interest, please, in anything that's on the agenda. I don't see any. OK, um, that's fine, in which case we'll move on to the minutes of the meeting that we're on on the 2nd of March 2022. Um, I won't flog through them uh, page by page because we've got a big agenda today. So anybody got any comments on anything in the minutes and I'll just take them. Sal? Just to say, Andy, that Danny hasn't yet joined us, but I do have some comments from Danny that were submitted um, via email which I can either um, go through now or I can take those and make those. that it's around phrasing um, of her report. OK, um, as reflected in the minutes. OK, so do you want to just briefly? Yes, um, so page three, they all relate to page three or page four. So page three, paragraph one, um, G GPs have indicated that they wanted an improved access to hospital departments, especially for wait patients waiting for tests and follow up. Page three, paragraph two, sentence four. Dami was pleased to advise that there was a stable turnover of staff and the trust was continuing with a huge recruitment effort, including recruiting further nurses from overseas. Paragraph three. Dami advised that the staff survey had also highlighted ongoing work needed to improve safe working numbers, motivation and engagement, bullying and harassment. And then on page four, paragraph two, concerns raised, um, hurt and burdened due to race inequality issues. And finally, page four, paragraph four, to be rephrased as the deputy chief nurse was working on an establishment review, a plan to ensure that the right numbers of nurses and midwives covered each area. And there are plans for a similar review of other staff groups across the board. Allowing staff to move more easily across areas was another endeavour being considered at place. OK, as I read that, there's there's not it, it's an emphasis difference in tone, isn't it? Mostly. Yes. OK, thank you. Thank so you. with those amendments from Dami, uh, are we happy to agree the minutes? Yep. OK, thank you very much. And as fast as my finger can go through, we'll go on to the actions arising. Uh, the first one was about um, community uh, Lily to liaise with Director of Strategy. Is that complete, Sal? It's down as a tick. You, you're muted. First of the meeting. Um, I believe it is, yes. Yeah. OK. I don't know if Lily's on. No, I don't think she is. OK. Uh, we'll take that as agreed. The outpatient letter review update provide details to Susan Holton, a prospective member of the working group, and that's been shared. And modern healthcare signage to UTC, uh, Tom, has been improved. If Tom's on. Yeah, that's all complete now. OK, thank you. Sorry, can I just go back, Andy, because I did have one point on the, on the minutes, but I just didn't raise my hand in time. 
No, I don't know about that. <laughs> I'm happy to put it in the chat. It's just a, it's just a point of uh, uh, of detail in the in the estates bit. So I'll put it in the chat if you could. Yeah, yeah that's fine. The sound pick up. Yeah, thank you. OK, so we move on then to the feedback by the governors um, and we start off with Governor Activities, Shirley. OK, another busy three months for the governor since the last Council of Governors and I'm pleased to report that we've had a really high attendance rate of governors at our meetings. So thank you to everyone who has managed to to get there and contribute. Also to the staff governors who took time out from busy working days to set up as and man a stand to engage with members of staff and talk about their role. Really super to do that. So thanks to them too. Not on the governor's list because it's strictly not a governor's duty, but we have a number of governors now who are volunteering within the hospitals to help the trust achieve targets on specific programmes that they are looking to to better, such things like uh, patient feedback. So thank you to them for showing that additional commitment. It's really appreciated by everyone around. And also, last but not least at this point, to David. David, it's been great having you um, working with us and standing in twice as Deputy Chief Exec. We've really enjoyed working with you in that capacity and look forward to working with you back in your uh, clinical role. But thank you for the way that you have worked with us and in two very difficult periods. And also welcome, Julie. We really look forward to working with you. So thank you. We'd also like at this point to have said something about Merrick, but as he's not here, perhaps I could do that a little later on. Oops. I've just unmuted myself. Yeah, he's going to be around for the finance piece in the closed board. So perhaps I could do that then, Andy. Yeah, thank you. And of course I should have, because I've got so used to her being around for the last six weeks, uh, I said, formally welcome to Julie to the first Council of Governors meeting. Uh, so uh, obviously very welcome on this meeting. Uh, so seems like you've been here ages already. So yes, Andy, thank you so much. Lovely to meet you all. I, I have met quite a lot of you already. I take that as a compliment, Andy. You see me as yes. part, part, part of the furniture already. I'm part of part of the family. Indeed. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you for that. Any questions for Shirley on that? Yeah, it's quite Quite a lot going on actually, wasn't that, over this period? Mm. So my thanks as always to the governors who, who've taken part in all that. You know, we do appreciate uh, that uh, that commitment. And it's brilliant to hear that governors are volunteering as well, because, you know, it's it's so good to have the volunteers back in the, in the hospital. And hopefully those who are volunteering are taking part in the tea party that's on, on Friday. Um, so uh, that's a separate one. OK, thank you, Shirley. I don't think there's any questions for you. Um, next one, uh, Chris Howarth, are you on? I am. I am on. I, I arrived a little late. I probably made you feel nervous. Apologies for that. Another meeting overran. Um, and um, members will, will have had before them the um, peg uh, minutes for the last the last meeting. So firstly, I'd just like to um, Thank uh, very much the team for developing the uh, the new um, uh, web page uh, for for uh, being with us um, and for discussing the, uh, the the development for um, outpatient information, which is something that we is ongoing uh, and which uh, members of PEG have taken a great deal of of interest in, um, and we and we wait with some excitement to see how that uh, how that actually works. It sounded good. On, on paper, I think there were still some uh, some concerns and questions you'll see um, in the in the report back. Um, and then if I just move on to uh, express our joy, I think maybe that's putting it slightly too strongly, but our pleasure um, at the new format uh, for the um, the quality report, which um, I, I hope that the board also are finding 
a lot more accessible um, and, and easy to, to, to pull information out from. There was some, there was some, as you'll see um, in the minutes, there were, there were some elements of information that gave us some pause for, for concern, but um, I think we felt reassured um, uh, strongly that those, those areas were being uh, addressed by the board and that non-executives uh, were, working, were working hard to address those or to make sure those areas were addressed. Um, and I'm trying, I'm trying to learn the art of brevity. Uh, so if I pause there and see if there are uh, if there are questions, if that's OK, Andy. Yeah, thank you, Chris. That's uh, remark remarkably brief. Thank you. Um, very, very good. Um, any questions for Chris? This I think it's a very interesting report, and I, I agree with you, by the way, uh, I think on behalf of the non-execs to say that the new quality report, like the new performance report before it, takes some getting used to, but once you're used to it, I think it's really helpful. Um, and having both reports in a similar format, I think, really works. Yeah, and apologies if people thought I was too brief, but you could give me feedback no, no, later. Can... Later, but I, I, I feel we always have a we always struggle to meet meet time. So thank you very much. Back to you, Andy. I was complimenting you, honestly. Um, so thank you. Um, membership and community engagement group report. Uh, Lily, you, you're practicing the art of just in time as well. I saw you coming on. So uh, well, yeah. <laughs> for some reason, uh, just for the case of membership, there uh, seems to be a problem joining on the computer. So I've had to join again on my mobile. Hang on a minute. You can see on the top of my head here because this is on a separate little stand. So this is better. Uh, so uh, very quickly, uh, we uh, had uh, a meeting and a very good report, an extensive report from the communications manager uh, to let us know what uh, has been going on. And I take it that people have uh, read uh, the report and we have very much thank her for uh, the amount of work that has been going on she's fairly new in her position and she said that uh, she particularly appreciated coming in at a time when the uh, medals were being given to staff because it was uh, and getting all that together because that was a really joyful experience for everyone in spite of all the hard work and everything else has, has go, gone on into uh, uh, what has happened over the course of the last two years. And I see Louise is nodding, so I think there is a little bit uh, still left uh, to uh, uh, hand over some of those uh, medals. But uh, anyone that she has spoken to, and certainly I as one of the recipients have very much appreciated uh, the medals and uh, I have as a result given my uh, book which is really great and gave the sense of how much people have been engaged to the local library and I think uh, if uh, other people have not or if there are still libraries in the areas that we cover may I suggest that then the books were sent to them so that the other members can also of the uh, and patients can see really the amount of effort that has gone uh, into uh, all this work. Uh, we talked about uh, how we could engage more younger uh, patients. And with that, uh, uh, we reflected on the work that's already going on, uh, which Tom is leading, uh, uh, and we have invited him to come and speak to us at the next meeting with the Bourne Academy. So uh, I won't say much more about that until uh, we have found out where that has uh, exactly got to but we are well aware that uh, it would be quite useful to get more of the younger members uh, both to hear their views and also to get engaged uh, in either voluntary activities or as apprentices so i think that about covers most important items thank you lily that's uh, very very clear um any questions for lily louise Sorry, I thought I put something in the chat, but I must have put it in a different chat. Um, I, I just was going to say a great idea with the with regards to the libraries, and I'll make sure that I work with Lucy on doing that and, and you know distributing them. And yes, we are just in that final process of making sure that all staff have had a medal and a book. 
if I sent that message separately to somebody by mistake, then so. <laughs> and I think we've also completed those four governors that have left uh, that were here f during the uh, during the pandemic. Um, because I know I know if uh, contacted me and he's now got his etc. So I think we've all we've covered covered that base as well. Anything else for Lily? I mean, great idea. We've got to reach out to the youngsters and you know, using the Bourne Academy, Tom, I know you're in close kind of is, is a really good way of doing that. And as as we engage with them on all sorts of different things, which I know we are through Louise's team as well, uh -huh. um, we can sign them up, you know, which is a great opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> now we had a very positive meeting with them actually, so I'll report on maybe next time. Okay, good. Thank you. So a uh, slight change to the agenda now. Um, uh, we're going to. I'm going to ask James to present just before David gives these the assurance report. And David's giving the assurance report, obviously, because he was here for most of this period. Um, so it's his uh, hurrah on, in that sense. But uh, because James has got uh, other things on on his agenda today, uh, he's asked to go first. So James, thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everybody. So um, we've got the performance report here from May. Uh, sorry, from March, and I will just uh, give a just illuminate that a little bit. When we were in March, you'll see from the 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 narrative, it was a difficult month. We were in COVID. We were having significant impact from COVID during the time, and that comes across really in a fair few of the sections of the report. So we had at any one time we, we had a sort of an average of about sixty three COVID patients in the organisation, and the Omicron outbreak, let's not forget, was far more transmissible. So we were getting a lot more outbreaks across the hospital than we had in previous waves. So on average, we had 82 beds closed at any one time during March. Now that spe spiked up to a lot more. There was a, a day where I sat in the bed meeting of 110 beds uh, closed due to isolation and uh, over 80 COVID. So that impact on the organisation was significant. It meant that we weren't able to get the flow into the organisation through A&E and through the ambulances that we would normally. And it meant that our flow out of the organisation was impaired in a number of ways as well. Like patients are isolating or with COVID, we had difficulty getting them to their uh, their homes often. We always had difficulty getting them back to um, other places of residence due to fear of infecting care homes and nursing homes and other Dom care packages. So it, the flow through in and out of our organisation was challenged very much as a result of that. And we needed more beds. So we were in all of our escalation beds. We were also in Ashford in our uh, escalate in our um, elective centre, in our elective wards, one of our elective wards for all but the last month, uh, week, I think, of that month. So it was really challenged uh, across the piece. So with that in mind, um, just looking at the electives, you can see from from where we achieved on the electives, we actually did relatively well against the plan that we thought we would achieve. We we achieved 111 percent of the activity that we thought we were going to. So in terms of activity, we still managed to achieve well, but our plan was reduced because we knew March was going to be a challenging month. Um, you can see on our um, restoration dashboard that pulls out the key things. I think the key things governors want to see is that where we have priorities that we are um, concentrating on those in terms of waiting time. So our cancer waits, um, our long cancer waits over 102 days, 104 days, sorry, um, are down to 25. So despite the challenge in the period, we are focusing on those important um, urgent pathways. And the 62 patients waiting over 62 days was down as well to 104. And the, so we're concentrating on the urgent stuff and we still managed to do that. Um, Although the number of patients, long waiting patients has increased. So the number of patients waiting over 52 weeks increased in March, and it also continued in April and May. So you'll see that in future reports. Our outpatient activity was up, and that was because we couldn't do all the inpatient activity we wanted to. So um, we had people doing clinics instead of theatres because we were in all the beds. Um, and we had outsourcing. But you see, it's a, it's a it's a mixed picture, but we managed to get some good activity through on outpatients. And in terms of activity overall, that was good. And our cancer was good. Um, 
we do have some challenges in in the piece and you'll see that in the report particularly around dermatology gynecology neurology or max facts so we have some long waiting patients there in the report you see the detail we have around some of our follow-up waiting times which remains to be a challenge in terms of ed um it was one of our busiest months on record actually we did a reporting change in month because we um we, we introduced navigation and that meant that actually some patients instead of going to the utc first went directly to um other parts of our urgent care system within our hospital but it meant that they weren't counted twice as they had been historically so if we hadn't made that change march would have been head and shoulders uh, above any other month in terms of attendances so it was a, a very very busy month um, and this is when it was getting you know I, i've said to uh and I've spoken at previous meetings said it was a real challenge. The hardest part of COVID was in these latter months where we had the restoration agenda, we had very heavy attendances for A&E, and we had a lot of beds used for COVID and COVID isolation. Um, and I suppose just the, the last part on, on A&E is around the ambulance waiting times. We did have challenge um, in our ambulance waits over 60 minutes and 30 to 60 minutes. And that was, as I say, through this flow through uh, the organisation that gave us challenge. And in terms of um, diagnostic weights, you see we have 91.8. It's a little bit of a deterioration on the previous month. Um, but the, the challenges there are articulated into what particular types of diagnostic caused us um, a bit of delay. Um, and endoscopy was a slight deterioration on performance, but we always said that the previous month was good. We we're expecting a bit of a bounce, um, but overall it would be a good picture. And cancer was was a good good improvement so despite the challenges that I've described to you we really focused on um, cancer uh, performance and managed to turn around some of the sort of few months that we'd had of non-achievement so we achieved five of the eight standards uh, in cancer and the three that we missed were were by a very small margin so we achieved the TWR which was great that we got that back the TWR breast the 31 day diagnostic to treatment 31 day subsequent drug treatment and the 28 day fast diagnostic all achieved where we didn't achieve was the 62 day screening and that was by one patient and um, the 32 the 31 day subsequent that again was by one patient that missed and the 62 standard was 17 patients that breached so really strong performance on cancer and we we had been talking here previously about what we were doing to make that that change that we were doing some demand of capacity work we were really focusing on the front end of the pathway getting the outpatient appointment first you see that's that has um made some inroads and i just wanted to spend just one minute briefly on on what's happening now because this was um this was in March. So in April, things were slightly better. We had um, the bank holidays, we had the impact of Easter. And then, so that sort of challenged us a little bit in terms of working days. Um, but COVID has sort of come down a bit. So the number of COVID patients in the organisation has reduced significantly. So we're running at about somewhere between five and 12 during April and May, um, a few, bit less now, and relatively few, if, if any, isolating patients so that impact has really helped the organization the challenge that we will have as we go forward is um, we've obviously had uh, our implementation of Surrey safe care and that's our new electronic patient record and uh, like any major transformation you know as Andy described it to me this morning and it's a really good analogy that the the computer system in a hospital is a beating heart of the organization and so to take that out and do the transformation we've done has been a real challenge we have some fantastic achievement but it has given us some operational challenge and that has impacted on some of our performance so as we come on in subsequent months and we look back to reflect on the performance in um, may and june we will see the impact of um, the CERNA implementation on some components of our performance particularly the outpatient side and the um, the urgent care performance of the standard, the AE standard. So we will um, see some some challenge against those standards as a result of CERNA. But you know, we, we're hoping to get those issues. We've got plans to get that behind us. So as we go forward, we've got plans to rectify that. But that's just something to um, put a heads up of some of the challenges that we're currently facing in terms of running the organisation. And then we will stop there and just take any questions if that's OK. Thanks, James. And just just to add that the the non executives on the uh, digital committee, and I speak for Chris Kettley because unfortunately Chris Kettley is not very well at all at the moment. Um, 
but Chris as co-chair of the digital uh, committee uh, with Royal Surrey um, and I'm on that committee as well and the digital through the digital committee have been pushing you know, the team uh, to uh, to have the plans as James said he, he was explaining the plans to me today as, as was Simon um, that yes we have issues um, but there are plans to address those issues uh, and I think I agreed with the chair of Royal Surrey the other day that we've for a huge transformation project it has gone I wouldn't say smoothly but it has gone remarkably well um, and yes there are lumpy bits um, that still need addressing but uh, you know it's it has gone very well and the credit to Simon's team and all the clinicians as well in the, in the hospital and the admin folk who've been working really hard to get it so um, I'm gonna open I'm gonna be quiet and open up to questions at this point questions either on the report in front of you or, or as uh, James anything that you're hearing uh, from your members or, or around the patch uh, most welcome to ask any sort of questions on the operations. I don't think that's ever happened to me before, Andy. I think that... Wow. <laughs> I did put in the chat that TWR is two week rule. <laughs> but, um, just in case you'd baffled people. No, no questions for James. OK, James, you're off the hook. Fantastic job. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, and now uh, we go back uh, a step. And as I say, David's uh, last report in his uh, interim chief executive hat. I'll hand over to you, David. Uh, Andy, I think you have got a question, though. Oh, I can't there, see it. There was a, there was no, a hand up. Hats. It's just gone down. That's me, actually. I just wanted to highlight uh, that James and his team of managers have done an amazing job during the last uh, few weeks uh, as part of studying the... Uh, I can't years. hear. Sorry. I, uh, I don't know if anybody else can, Thank but... I... Hi. Andy, can you hear me now? Just about, yes. Sorry, habit, I just... Yes, it is me. I just wanted to highlight, uh, you know, the work done by James and actually all managers in the different departments during the last uh, few weeks of the production of study safe care, which has been exceptional actually and usually their work is not highly identified and accredited by others so that's, that's what i wanted to highlight okay thank you yeah thank you that's very kind thank you yeah and i think we've all seen some really great teamwork going mm. on and people passing on hot tips and uh you know and people coming out, I was struck by intensive care who on the Sunday uh, that it went live, they were all there and they all came in and worked and, and actually got it working. And I think theirs has one been, been one of the smoothest implementations, hasn't it? So, uh, but, you know, there's all sorts of stories like that around the hospital. Thank you, Mohammed, for that. Um, OK, so we will now hand over to David. Uh, thank, thank you, Andy. Um, <clears throat> Um, firstly, I, I would like to thank everyone for the support you've given me during this time. And, and Shirley, thank you for your, for your kind words. That was very, very kind of you. And also, I'd like to extend my welcome to Julie in her new role in the Trust. Um, as Andy says, this report seems seems like about 10 years ago now when I look at it, because so much has, has changed. And the details in the report, and I think it's, it's, it's in a number of sections, but I think in the first section, you can see that uh, sorry, safe care implementation. We were planning it at that time. And as you can see, this is um, very, um, very top of our mind as we've gone through that. And, and Simon and his team and James have done an amazing job, as, as Mohammed says. It is one of the most complex things that you can do. It was done across two organisations. And, and actually, I think we can all be really proud of ourselves. As Andy says, it's not without its little bumps in the road, and there's certainly more work to do. Uh, and our staff are coping with that and it's given them it's given them an issues and we are getting around to sort that out but it will be a fantastic step forward um, not only for our organization but as a system as we're doing it with Royal Surrey and as SASH come online as well so it's an absolute brilliant piece of work there's also a section in there on finance and as you can see we we finished the last financial year very strongly um, but as you can imagine 
as we've heard in the uh, in the news, the financial environment that we're facing going forward is going to be very taxing, and clearly there is a big financial gap to close. Um, and we're all working really hard with the system to work out how we can close that, but how we can also do that in a way that looks after our patients and our community and our care in the process going forward. There are a number of programmes that, that we started a few months ago, which are still going. And I think, I think as, as you can see, and, and, and James has talked about the operational issues that we've had during this time, but actually those programmes do seem to be the right thing to do. We know that only as a system can we look after our patients, that actually hospital care is not always the right place for people. And most people do want to be at home and have support closer to home. And that's what we're working towards. And actually that programme, which is earmarked the main effort, there's some detail in there, is now demonstrating that actually even through um, implementation of uh, Surrey Safe Care, the organisation was in Opal 2, which means that we had plenty of capacity that we went through. And I think that is absolutely an amazing achievement uh, for the uh, operational teams. And actually, it was unlike anywhere we saw in the in the rest of the system. So our teams did a really fantastic job there. The other the other part that we talk about is is the um, is the elective centre, the Surrey Heartlands Elective Centre over at Ashford. And as you know, earlier on in the um, in the pandemic, we started earmarking that as a ring fenced elective site, which is clearly the way to go forward. And and as we reported last time. Um, and Eden a region um, was, in, was encouraging us to, to develop this as a regional centre. And actually that's progressing well. We've, um, we've been granted or given the next green light to submit a case for the first phase, which is detailed in this report. And we've been working with a system to work out, well, actually what elective care we're going to put in there uh, and is how that is going to help the rest of the system and certainly mainly help our patients in receiving the treatment in a timely way that has been delayed uh, through COVID. Um, but the, the most important um, project is Louise's project, which is looking after our people through this, this process. And, and, the, and the team, the whole team have been through a difficult time for two years, and we're asking them to work uh, even harder during this time. And part of that is to support them through that, make sure that our processes are right as we go through this uh, this, this challenging time in, in, in uh, recovering from where we were, uh, but also to recruit and retain our staff as we go through. And, I, and there's many things that, that we can point to, but I think, um, I think the Edu Kitchen, which Louise has put in for parliamentary ward, is absolutely fantastic for staff. The Health and Wellbeing Centre is absolutely amazing, and the developments over in Ashford are also uh, absolutely brilliant. The, um, the maternity action plan is in there because we did have some concerns about staffing and, and, and staff raised concerns to um, Jane, who is our maternity champion, um, and we needed to address those. And that's just giving you some information there. The next session gives how we're assessing risks. And as you can see, the risks are around finance, um, workforce and, and also quality. I think there's a disconnect between our KPIs and actually our assessment, but the assessment I think is right, and we need to work on our, our KPIs for that. Um, and then I've just left a few examples of some of the great things that were done. And I think the one thing that we'd like to highlight is the healing arts and the um and the and the garden that Marcin put so much uh, effort in developing, which was an absolutely fabulous event in, in opening and actually has been so well received by patients in a really difficult time in their lives. Um, and actually, we do need to provide a space for our staff as well, and Marcin's working on that now. Um, and and I think I'd like to, I think I'll stop there. I think Julie wants to give some indication of where we're, where we're going on now, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. So if that's all right, Andy, I'll, I'll pass over to Julie. Yeah, thank you, David, Julie. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, David. And clearly, I just wanted to 
demonstrate that uh, David and I are completely aligned in terms of the work that David has led in the period of time that he's been acting chief executive. And to add my thanks to David, building on other colleagues' thanks um, with the leadership that you have demonstrated and the tangible results that we have seen through the key priorities that you have just outlined. So um, I'd just be really grateful that my thanks are minuted along with colleagues. And yes, just to assure governors and colleagues that um, the, the, the work that you have taken forward that is absolutely in train and that we are absolutely building on will continue with my objectives and in terms of the challenges around the finances alongside the opportunities for collaboration across the system and elective recovery as we move out of this COVID phase. Um, there are some big challenges, but it is very exciting and we are very fortunate to have the good foundation in terms of moving forward. Uh, so I think I'll hold it there. I really just wanted to a give my thanks and demonstrate that uh, things will continue and, uh, and build and improve on what's there already. So thank you very much. Thanks, Julie. So open now to questions for David uh, or indeed for Julie. One thing that's been said so far. You're very quiet today, governors. Lily? Uh, just a very quick one. Uh, uh, David didn't mention it, uh, and I don't think we have talked about uh, the work on the research that has been done at the hospital in the COVID times. And maybe David just wants to say something more about it, because I think that was quite exceptional in these difficult times and very well recognised. Yeah, I mean, I think you can see in my report that we did have an awards uh, afternoon, which I think well, which, Lily, you, you know, we're all incredibly proud of because during that time we did recruit many patients to the big national trials and also we, we set up trials. So we, we developed and designed our own studies during this time and we published hugely in the academic journals. So I think that what I think that is very impressive. And I was I was in there listening to the talks on some of the research that we had uh, delivered and I and I don't think there's many hospitals um, outside some of the biggest teaching hospitals which could have could have actually talked about some of their work as much as we talked about there so Lily you're really it's really good to bring that up and I'm really grateful to the R&D department but also for the willingness of um, all our clinicians <laughs> and staff to be involved in research and our patients our patients were really willing to to be involved as well and their relatives so very good point Lily. And just to and add, I just want to. Uh, sorry. So you go on first, Lily. Uh, I just wanted to add that uh, this has not just uh, uh, been a local effort uh, because I heard about uh, uh, work on the nasal spray through my daughter who lives in Vancouver, yeah. and she has heard from the company and the colleagues uh, there, and she works in health communication. So uh, this is a worldwide recognition and not just uh, local. Yeah, no, we, we, we set up a number of international studies working with with European colleagues and and even China. So the univer one of the university in China, we set up a study with as well. <coughs> so uh, so we, we yeah, we've done some really great work, I think, Lenny. Yes, I was going to say a lot of that is captured in the book that you'll have seen most of you, you know, so we've tried to capture that in the panda in the in the yearbook. Uh, and there's some uh, some great things. If if you ignore the picture of me getting giving my plasma, that is. Um, so, uh, I mean, if so, the governors would like, I will send them the links to all the publications. That's the super. Book. Yeah, I think that'll be good. No, we. I mean, our research department, you know, is is really flying in that sense. I mean, it's very different to how it was before the pandemic because of uh, uh, various financial uh, things that have happened. Uh, people, you know, withdrawing uh, funding and so on, uh, but it's it, it really does do some high quality work, doesn't it, David? Yeah. So thank you for that, Lily. Uh, good reminder. Any other questions, comments? 
OK, uh, in which case we will move on. Uh, we're in danger of, of finishing early. Um, so we move on now to statutory uh, constitution group committee minutes. It's got my name on. Um, but Sally, you're going to talk to these. Um, yes, I'm very happy to. Can you hear me OK? My headphones have slightly failed me in the last few minutes. OK, um, so you have the minutes. Um, they can be um, taken as read um, and I believe I was part present at the meeting and there was quite some discussion around um, the um, the inclusion of the rest of England. Uh, um, constituency um, into submerging so um, one of our constituency, which is the Richmond and Hounslow constituency with the rest of England. And I'm aware that Anu was tasked with um, investigating um, the um, the number of outpatient attendances um, to, to, to review our methodology as to how many seats that should in fact include. And um, the um, the thinking was that we would merge the two and have two um, elected governors from this West of England constituency. And of course, we have elections coming up later this year. Um, so we currently have one vacancy for the rest of England, which you'll see in the next pa paper, um, 7.2. Um, so um, I'm happy to take any questions or, or attempt to answer any questions on Anu's behalf. Thank you. Thank you, Sal. And just to be clear, what, what we what we decided, because the rest of England very difficult to recruit to, uh, the Constitution Group agreed that uh, we would merge it with the Richmond, uh, Kingston one, etc., so that then we'd have two governors covering that um, because the, the two together. Now, subsequently, Anu came to me and said it wasn't quite at the six percent, but it was very close. And so we, by email, then we, we agreed that, that we would uh, stick with that and because uh, the advantage of having two governors to cover both the rest of England and and that constituency. So if you as you read those minutes, uh, you'll see various addendums and things and that that's what that means. But the constitution group all agreed uh, that that was a sensible way forward. And I'm as I say, I'm happy to answer questions as well as Sal. OK. Um, now the next one is the membership of the Council of Governors and uh, Sal, you're going to handle this one. Yes, so the the council are asked to note the current register um, of members of the Council of Governors and the only point I would wish to draw out is that we, as I mentioned earlier at the start of the meeting, um, we do not currently have a representative or an appointed governor from Runnymede Borough Council and up until today, we had not yet been advised. Uh, so Mark Adams was unsuccessful um, in the local borough council elections. And today we were advised of Deb Hughes replacement. Just Deb decided not to stand in the recent elections and councillor um, Ellen Nicholson will be taking her place going forward for a period of three years up until 2025. There's nothing else to pull out of this report, Andy. OK, thank you. So I think we ought to record our thanks uh, to to Mark, who Mark was very enthusiastic actually to do this role, and he's obviously one of the uh, downsides of being an account a councillor is you can get voted off and then you lose the role. Um, but I think Mark was actually very very good, one of the one of the better uh, appointed governors, I think, uh, in terms of his enthusiasm uh, to learn, uh, and of course. Uh, Deborah was uh, absolutely brilliant in Woking and she really did represent Woking really well, uh, making the point about transport uh, to Ashford, for example, uh, and you know, using her sort of clinical knowledge as well as her councillor knowledge to make that link. So I think uh, a big thank you from all of us, I think, to to her as well. And um, we look forward to um, 
both their replacements uh, in due course. And Ellen, of course, has now been uh, we only got literally only got the letter today, so it was too late to invite her to to this meeting. But uh, uh, no doubt we will get running meeting in due course. So. Uh, Councillor Howarth. Um, I was just about to put my hand down because I was only going to say yes, we will be having a meeting um, soon that will um, allow us to put the rest of our outside appointments together. And at that point, we'll be able to announce who who's taken Mark's role. OK, is there a sort of time scale on that, uh, Chris? Uh, there is, and I run my councillor system, so I should be able to tell you, but I'd have to, I'd, I'd probably take a bit long, but it was within a, within a month anyway. That's fine. Probably less, probably less. OK, no, that's super. Uh, thank you for that, Chris. That's very helpful. OK, so that is the membership and we do have elections uh, for at the end of the year, don't we, uh, Sal? Some elections coming through. OK. And more on that in due course. So if there are no more questions then now, uh, one of the things that um, Shirley alerted me to, Shirley and Michael in, the, in our meeting, uh, was the concerns the governors had about some aspects of the staff survey um, and obviously its impact on recruitment and retention because clearly unless we have uh, enough staff and we have staff that really want to be here um, then obviously they can't serve our patients as, uh, as well as they could so um, I've asked Louise uh, to to give a good uh, debrief on, on those issues. Uh, and I know Lu Louise has been in contact with Dami as chair of the People Committee. Obviously, Dami couldn't make it uh, today um, uh, so that uh, you're getting a kind of joint exec, non-exec view here. So I'm going to hand over to Louise. Thanks, Andy. Um, could, could you just remind me of what time we've got? Because I've got the next two items, haven't I? Um, and uh, I'm always bad at overrunning, so if you don't mind, just let me know. Sorry, you're on mute, Andy. Thank you for that. Because <laughs> we're running ahead of time, technically you have until 5.35, but I'm sure you okay. won't need that. Yeah. Um, but plenty of time is the answer. That's right. Okay, brilliant. So um, so there's two, two items under the, sh uh, the strategy. Um, oh. Uh, today and uh, both of those are uh, within the people domain and actually there's quite a lot of overlap within the two items so the first item that um, we always uh, brief governors on is the staff survey results um, now you will um, sympathize with me that um, whilst the field work for the staff sur survey happens in the autumn it takes a long time before the results are published and we're able to go through our governance governance cycle to be able to present them but um but just to give you a summary of, of what they look like and obviously what you've got in front of you is the fairly detailed board report that went to the trust board on the 31st of march uh, prior to that we'd obviously done quite a uh, a big debrief with our trust executive committee and each of the divisions had then presented the reflections on the divisional um, results and uh, their particular actions that they were going to work on um, and we've also done a fairly detailed review of the staff survey at the people committee as you would expect so um, so notwithstanding that um, it's still useful just to go through those those themes with you today um, but obviously some of the work has already started some of the work is in progress and there's quite a big overlap with the second item on the agenda which is as Andy is has um has referenced is a little bit about where we are with recruitment but mostly where we are with retention and um a new um program of work that that, that Ashton and St Peter's is involved in and I wanted just to talk that through with you but you'll see that there's a lot of overlap between feedback from the staff survey and some of the work that we're prioritizing to try to deliver in 22-23 um so in terms of the, the staff survey and, and the, the report that you have in front of you was written without the um, um, hindsight of the national results being published. So I can give you a little bit of context in terms of where we sit nationally. 
Um, so uh, staff survey came out. We had a really good response rate this year compared to the previous year where we'd seen quite a big dip. So it's always good when you see an increase in the response rate because you hope that the results um, are more reflective of more people. Um, and you, you can see from, from the narrative that there are areas where we continue to, to, to do well and uh, both on and above the national average. So I'll, I'll take you through you know, some of that. Uh, I think the important context to frame at the beginning is to say that, not surprisingly, and I think if you read the minutes from the, from the March board, David, as the chief executive at the time, was reflecting this, um, not surprisingly, um, the national results have deteriorated quite significantly across the board. So, um, you know, we're faced with a situation whereby um, the questions around recommending organisations as a place to work or a question about, you know, whether I have an intention to leave my job in the next 12 months, um, question around whether or not I think that I've got enough resources in my team to do my job effectively, you know, nationally, it, across all of those domains, there's been quite a significant deterioration. Um, and the, the most telling statistic that, that I've seen is that the NHS has grown um, in, uh, in size since COVID by 10%. And yet, um, when you look at the productivity metrics, we've probably reduced our productivity by more than 10%, um, maybe 16% reduction in productivity. And the question that we ask staff in the survey about, do you think you've got enough resources to do your job effectively, has deteriorated by 11%. So, you know, that, what, what story is that telling us? You know, clearly that's, you know, a, quite an increased um, requirement for more people to manage a pandemic, to, to, to manage more beds, to, um, to run an organisation in, in a different way. But that hasn't necessarily reflected in a, um, you know, making people's jobs easier or making people feel like they've got enough resources within their teams to do their jobs effectively. So just important really to give that national context. When I did a review of our staff survey results uh, against the national results, and in particular looking at other acute trusts, as you would do, um, we are um, in the in all domains, we are average, if not above average for, the, for these results. So, you know, we've, certainly we've got some trust locally to us, Surrey and Sussex, Dash and Royal Surrey always do better in their staff surveys, and we've seen that trend continue. And in fact, in fact, SASH have for many years been one of the top national performers in terms of how people rate that organisation as a place to work. Um, however, in terms of comparison to the national trend, you know, we are still a, a, a good performer, so that, that's good to see. Obviously, there's areas um, that, that we need to work on, and the, the paper goes into the detail of that. And I suppose the ones that I would pick out um, in, in a bit more detail. So for the first time, um, we have been able to see the staff survey questions overlaid to the people uh, promise. Um, if you will recall, um, the NHS published um, something called the NHS People Plan in July of 2021. And uh, with that people plan, they published our people promise and in the next item I'll go into that in a bit more detail but for the first time they were able to do the analysis of the staff survey results against the domains of the of the people plan and the board paper that you've got in front of you just goes through a little bit of that in terms of where we think uh, there are some positive results and the areas for improvement. The, 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 the other big domain that we are always interested in is our staff engagement scores and there's nine questions that make up the, the overall staff engagement score um, that you've got under table three four and five um, the detail of that and um, it's really useful to look at those those questions and that domain over a long period of time to understand the journey that the organization's gone on in terms of engagement and you know a very important cultural barometer for us. Um, and so we have seen in some of those areas um, questions around ability to improve, uh, make suggestions around how I do my job and, and actually make improvements work. Um, 
and some of the questions around advocacy have deteriorated and that is a concern you know that's not something that's not a trend that we want to see continue um, you can see um, the difference between the 2012 results and the 2021 uh, results are still significant but what we don't want to see is a deteriorating trend around those staff engagement scores so definitely something for us to think about and to make sure become important features of the work that we're doing going forward um, the other thing to say, and, and again, uh, um, there's a bit of an overlap with quite a lot of these agenda items because Andrew is going to talk to you uh, on the last agenda item about the CQC action plan and what we're doing. And so we obviously did some triangulation um, with the staff survey results and with the CQC findings just to see was that telling a consistent story. And we were able to look right down to sort of specialty level um, and right down to professional group to see, you know, where, where are people expressing uh, uh, disengagement or disenfranchised um, uh, feeling of working in the organisation? And is that consistent with what the CQC heard? And, and certainly in some places we were able to track that and, um, and that has continued to form part of the improvement plan that we've got in place, particularly within theatres and anaesthetics. Um, I think I'll probably just pause there to take any particular questions on the staff survey and then I can move into the second presentation. So Thanks. Andy, Thanks, I wonder Louise. if there's any questions around that. Yes, uh, so questions on, yeah, Colin. Are you there Colin? Yeah. yeah, apologies. Um, perhaps you could just summarise some of the actions you intend to take. Um, I've had a long career in the NHS and uh, most of the surveys always come up similar and it relates around pay, conditions, workload, and much of that is controlled by the government. So the trust really is very limited in what it can respond to. Um, you take, for instance, RCN survey, so on how many nurses are leaving, um, how many are not joining, there seems to be very little action from that. So what ha tends to happen is all of these surveys, the, the positive points are cherry picked, um, the pessimistic ones are sort of glossed over. Yeah, I'm happy to do that and, and hopefully when we go into the next item you'll see sort of, sort of a reasonable level of detail around the, the, the work, uh, the work that we're prioritising for this year. But but I guess um, for, for me, um, there is still quite a lot of work that we need to do around um, engagement of our teams, particularly uh, when they're going through um, change processes or when we when we are trying to reorientate the organisation um, around a, di a different approach. So a good example would be the work that David cited earlier around the elective centre. Now that obviously um, we have some, some real ambition around doing something quite different in order to um, ensure that we've got um, longevity in that elective work and that that, that is a better, um, better patient outcomes for our patients. Um, but actually what it will mean is that our clinicians, our third staff, um, and some of our other teams will need to think about working quite differently. And in an environment where they've gone through already quite a lot of change, and we know that um, the, the, the CQC um, inspection highlighted their feeling that they're not always listened to, or their feeling that they're expected to change, and that isn't always uh, you know, something that they see positively, then you know, we've, we've thought really long and hard about how do we make sure that in the, um, the way in which we implement this program of work, that we do that in a completely different way. So right from the very beginning, we've engaged um, an, a staff engagement expert to work alongside the program director. David has been really clear that the people change is like fundamentally one of the most important parts of the work that we need to do as a provider collaborative. And we need to do that with our 
uh, neighbouring organisations in a in a in a different and collaborative way, so that when the CQC come in, you know, in six months time and go and see those surgeons and theatre staff, there is a different narrative in terms of their involvement in something that has hopefully made their jobs better. So that's just, I suppose, one example of of something that that, that definitely we can do and. And as I said, we'll we'll be talking about the the uh, CQC action plan in a minute, and you can you can hear some of the other things that team are doing. I, I mean, I guess the, the the bit that I didn't reference was the focus around inclusion. So your the board paper does pull out um, how people do feel uh, differentially treated in the organisation, and that's some of the themes that came out of the um, the staff survey. So. Um, you know, there is a lot of work that we're doing at the moment around uh, making sure that um, that we focus on behaviours um, and focus on um, coaching people so that we're able to have um, uh, improve the way in which our uh, improve the relationships of the team. And I've talked about the culture transformation program. There's a number of elements to that that include a piece around um, improving people's practices, which is how, what do we do when things go wrong, when we end up in a disciplinary situation or a grievance situation, and how can we find opportunities to try to resolve issues before they go into those formal processes? And then in the circumstances where things do go through a formal process, how do we do it in a way that feels uh, like we are looking at resolution and mediation as opposed to punishment? So that's you know another very important program of work that that we'll be trying to uh, to to embed this year. Um, I suppose the, the the final bit is you know finding opportunities to continue to work in an agile and flexible way. So we're all transitioning back to a to a, to a different way of working again, but we do know that the some of the opportunities that we've put in place. Um, because of COVID have meant that we have been able to improve people's flexible working and it's a it's a real key um, issue in terms of retention so things like using our rostering system more intelligently so people are um, are sighted on you know wh when they're going to work and they're able to plan their lives better as well as continuing to work in an agile way are all things that will make people's experience improve. So um, we have a number of programmes of work, which I'm about to talk about, that, and you'll be able to see from that where all of those actions will be um, hopefully, you know, kind of monitored, where, they, where we'll present um, progress reports up to the, to the non-executives through things like the People Committee to, to be able to get assurance that we are acting on the feedback that we get from our, our colleagues. I think, Shirley, you're next. Shirley, yeah. Yes, I think I understood you to say there was a 10% increase in staffing levels, Louise, in the NHS. Nationally, yes. Yeah. Nationally. What are the what's the increase for St Peter's? Do you do you know roughly? I think we've roughly increased by about the, about the same amount, Shirley. So I think yeah, 500 additional posts since pre-COVID. Um, obviously, some of those. Um, you know, uh, will will start to come out. So investment in people to support, sorry, safe care implementation, um, in you know, in more people to cover more beds. We, I think it's something like a hundred additional beds that are in the system at the moment. Some of which we will start to to be able to come out of once we go back to working in a different way with our community partners. Um, but yes, we have seen. A, a corresponding increase in our workforce but if you talk to our teams and if you look at our results that isn't felt on the ground is that because the mix is perhaps less clinical is it clinical managerial mix how is that 500 made up um it is a combination of of all of the um staff groups including you know we we've we've taken on um the catering um, colleagues as part of a cheapy transfer, so you know it would include it would include those. Um, obviously, as I've said, we've got quite a lot more um, staff in place to support the rollout of Surrey Safe Care, but we have increased our clinical workforce quite significantly. Um, so, I mean, I guess um, 
at the moment, people are still stretched across our bed base and an operating um, portfolio that, 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 that is, is, you know, stretching them quite thin. So the more that we can get back to uh, to not not being in that position, hopefully people will start to see the benefit of that investment. OK, that's lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. Uh, Michael. Oh, thank you, Eddie. Oh, I just wanted if I could ask you, Louise, the the bar charts in the report are very intriguing and very interesting. And it would seem that almost all of the factors measured, which are in fact, I think mostly quite difficult factors to measure, but they've, they've got the results, that 2020 showed a very much a high spot in all sorts of things, motivation, advocacy, and everything like that. And that's dropped away in 2021. Now, is, it, is there a reason for that? Are people basically a little bit weary? Or is there some... Yeah. Perhaps, uh, perhaps the, the stress, because yeah. of the absence of stress, or let's say the reduction in stress, people are feeling a little flat. Well, I think there was definitely, you know, that spirit where people stepped up to uh, responding to a pandemic in, in the first instance, followed by the kind of um, people trying to reset and, and get back to normal. And then if you if you recall, we then ended up in uh, in the autumn of 2021, um, you know, then then feeling like um, we we might end up back into a, in a similar situation. So I think um, it is a reflection of people being quite tired. Um, I think it was a reflection of people having to still manage um, Omnicom and at the same time try and you know reset the organisation to be able to, con to 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 restart our elective work and 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 driving people to be able to do that. Um, and I think that's something that is ex being experienced across the NHS and not just at Ashford and St Peter's. Yeah, I, I would say you're right, Louise, because I think David could comment because he, he sort of led the organisation in, in both times, actually. Where, but we had a single, almost a single focus in that first bit of the pandemic. And now we're facing multiple challenges. Uh, the recovery still got the... Covid thing going on, certainly in the in the time of this staff survey, uh, but trying to recover services. So people, I think, were more stretched. David, weren't they? I, I think I think in the first wave, I think particular groups were stretched, and I think those groups have changed as we've gone through. But I think you're right that there are now many conflicting priorities. If if you were the, in the army and you did a tour of duty uh, on a campaign, you'd be getting six weeks R and R, but actually. We've had repeated waves of things, and now we're asking our teams to gird their loins to catch mm -hmm. up with the work that hasn't been done. And I think also the other impact is that, you know, the, the, the patients and the population are a bit weary and they're tired of waiting for the treatment now as well. And all that is playing a role. It's a much harder place uh, when people aren't cheering you on, but they're disappointed with some of these the shortfalls in the care that we know we're given at the moment so it is a difficult time and um it's why it's why louise and her team have put so much effort in trying to support the staff uh, through this but it's it, it's had its toll does that answer your question michael it does it does very much thank you very much indeed and thank you for those um, encouraging words um it's it's a little bit like an adrenaline rush in a crisis being sort of you feel awfully flat afterwards and I can understand it. Thank you very much for the explanation. Thank you. Any other questions before we ask Louise to carry on with the next piece? OK, back to you, Louise. OK, so the, the, the next item is um, I think the governors were, you know, on the back of the staff survey results, what are you doing? Um, and uh, in particular, um, a lens around retention and making Ashton St Peter's a good place to work. Um, so I've prepared a short um, slide deck, which um, you probably you won't have had an opportunity to have, have looked at. I'm going to present that now, but it is in your it is in admin control and in your pack if you wanted to to look at it um, yourself. But I will I'll just share this if that's okay, Andy. Okay, 
So just checking that people can see this. Yeah, we can see it, Louise. Perfect. Um, so I can't see you, Andy, so you'll have to interrupt me if you need to. OK, okay. So, so, so sort of thinking about um, the, the, the recruitment space and, and obviously, uh, you know, that's it's really important that we are uh, intelligently planning what we think we need in terms of the workforce. But you will also appreciate that that's incredibly difficult to do. So it's been really difficult to do over the last couple of years because we've had to to continue to react to uh, the, the way in which um, the pandemic has rolled out. It's really difficult to do going forward because we're now in a position where we're looking to um, recover quite a lot of that work. Um, but at the same time, think about how we do that with a mind to the deteriorating financial position and also how we do that um, with a with a with with a mind to to actually the labour market that we're working with at the moment. So just a couple of thoughts around recruitment, and then I'll spend most of the time talking about retention. So we've obviously done an annual review of our establishments, and we continue to do that. We do very regular reports up to the People Committee around the workforce establishments, and in particular when we're looking at at realigning them for the big parts of the workforce like nursing and midwifery, then we then we will take that through our the usual route of trust executive committee and people committing up to board just so that, that we're able to demonstrate both the, the rigor around those establishments but also um, that we are continuing to operate safe staffing levels. Um, so we convert that into recruitment forecast for each of the professional groups and again if you sit if, uh, for those of you who sit on things like the People Committee, you'll see a regular workforce report that then shows our progress against that recruitment forecast. We, we do a very detailed narrative um, around the BAF risks and how we're mitigating those risks. And obviously the first two risks are around recruitment and, and in particular um, forecasting the, the, the required workforce. Um, we then have internal strategy and scrutiny groups led by our clinical executives, so Andrew and David, who will look at our progress against um, these plans. And as I've said, despite a 10% growth in the workforce, um, there is still quite significant work, work, workforce gaps. And that, you know, is driving some of our bank and agency pressure um, and also driving some of the sort of requirements for us to think quite differently about how we recruit. So a good example being um, for the first time ever, we've now started to look internationally for some of our therapy and, and science and professional staff, our radiographers. Normally, um, previous to that, it had been just our, our nursing and uh, our nursing colleagues. And now we're now looking at how we can, can fill some other gaps in that way. Um, we're obviously doing a, a review of the establishment at the moment in order to consider the impact of the bed reduction programme and how we might convert back to the sort of pre-COVID way of working. Um, but as David has said, also thinking about what does it mean in terms of provider collaboratives and if we are going to do something quite different in terms of elective centre, then again, the workforce supply and how the workforce supply is deployed is going to be a really important feature of that. And then, you know, just you'll be, you'll be familiar because I talk a lot about the work that we're doing to try and be attractive, uh, both within the local and international market, but also um, the work that we're doing to try and make sure that we can um, start to get um, our, our local population thinking about us as an employer, that we start to talk about health and social care careers at a much earlier stage and that we are making those connections with schools as part of the anchor organisation strategy. So I'm, I'm only going to talk about recruitment on, on that slide. I'm going to switch to the focus that we've been putting on wellbeing and staff experience. And again, hopefully a lot of this is familiar to you, but I just wanted to, you know, if you look at the staff survey results, actually our feedback from colleagues around our attention to wellbeing has significantly improved. And that's really good to see. But we know that it um, continues to be really important that we look after people um, as we transition from uh, to, uh, to the next phase of, of the journey. And especially where things may, may start to become quite difficult in terms of, of the financial position. And we might need to start making some, some decisions 
that you know you, you know that that um you know people may not may not uh, like so how do we look after our colleagues and we've got a well-being framework that covers those six areas that you see on this slide and um the slide's very busy but it is in your pack and i would encourage you just to click on some of those if you can click on some of those links and just see what some of the resources are available because you know we've been able to significantly increase um, the focus that we put on well-being and we've referenced already the investment that we've made in the well-being facilities and you'll see on this slide um, some pictures from both the St Peter's and I'm really pleased to say now the Ashford well-being um, uh, centres um, with a focus on you know somewhere for teams to go for individuals and teams to go and relax uh, to have a break um, at St Peter's to do some exercise to have some fun um, and and you know just to be able to decompress um, either either after their shift or sort of during their break times. Uh, if you haven't been able to see this facility, I thought it was useful to show you those photos. But please do, um, please do go and have a look. And again, David's already talked about the investment that we've made in our catering facilities um, and how important that again is in terms of people feeling like we care about them, that they have a good experience. Of working here but also that you know they're well fed and they continue to do their jobs um for their patients well so um so that that that's some of the work that we've done but we, we recognize that and you can see from the staff survey that there is much more to do uh and we were approached um and i think i've talked to the to the council just sort of in headline terms about the fact that we were approached to be uh one of the 23 um sites nationally to be part of the People Promise Exemplar Programme. So I thought I would use that as an opportunity just to talk to you about what that means from a retention perspective um, and just a little bit about what the NHS is trying to do in terms of the Exemplar Programme. So you've got on this slide um, the People Plan pillars, those four pillars that if you go on to, if you click on the link that's on the bottom of this slide, You'll, that will take you to the NHS People Plan, and um, that is supplemented by a promise. And you know that promise is about the experience of working in the NHS for everybody. Um, it's something that was developed by NHS staff, so it's very much bottom up, the words and the themes. And I guess what they're saying is these are the things that we think will have the greatest impact on the experience of working in the NHS. Um, and you know. Through the engagement process, it's clear, and if you look at the staff survey, that for some people we do match the expectations of the promise, but for others we don't. And the ambition when this was published in 2021 was that by 2025 um, it would be a reality for uh, the majority of people working in the NHS. And as I've said already, we've now started to see the staff survey results being aligned to the people promise. So as part of your 23 trusts nationally, so that's acute trusts, community trusts, and mental health trusts, um, we are uh, part of a programme which is seeking to um, test, a, a, I suppose, a hypothesis around if you do um, a, a number of these improvement interventions, then that will have a corresponding positive impact on your, your retention. So it so sounds quite straightforward, but clearly is, is much more difficult to achieve. Um, but the being part of the programme means that we are both expected to do quite a lot of um, assessment of our position, improvement work, and then uh, pre pre presenting the, the results of that against our key metrics to NHSI. But in return, we get quite a lot of support from them and quite a lot of examples of best practice that we can then try out. So this is a, a really good example of in quality, sort of quality improvement and and thinking about how we apply that to the staff experience. It's a 12 month program and we're sort of uh, month three of that program. And you can see on the right hand side the domains that that makes up the people promise. So the first thing that, that we've done is clearly look at our levers data to try to understand what is our current level of turnover. Uh, where are the areas that you know that that potentially are outliers, and uh, and what does that mean in terms of the target that we set ourselves? So our target for turnover is 
to be less than 14%. And for voluntary turnover, so um, obviously there is a difference, but for voluntary turnover to be less than 10%. And, and if you look at the March 22 data, you can start to see that that is starting to slightly creep up. So we're not quite we're not quite meeting those those metrics at the moment. The year to date um, um, results for 21 22, uh, we did meet the target. But I think what you've heard that you've heard us, us talk about um, the the we know that if you look at the the national picture and we know if you look at our our trends, we're starting to see more people choosing to leave the NHS, more people choosing to leave Ashford and St Peter's. So really important that we that that we do think about uh, a way of uh, trying to test some improvement around retention and and that we have a real focus on that. And we have so we've looked at some of our our lever data. Why do people leave? And there's a range of things, but you've just given you a bit of a flavour of that. And I think this again was was um, data that we that we took from uh, the end of last year, so from March 22 around the reasons why people are, are leaving the organisation. Um, and I've also, just on that slide, I pulled out, um, when we looked at the staff survey results, these are the elements of the staff survey where we, fared, uh, where we didn't fare as well um, as, the, as the average national score. So those things around um, the burnout um, subscore and uh, the work pressure subscore score being quite important for us to think about, you know, thinking about leaving the organisation, uh, but also um, questions around our investment in people's career opportunities and learning. So that was another area that was that 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 we were we were um, less good on. Can't be the right word. So, as with all improvement programmes, we have started to think about our aims we have a there is a driver diagram that that, that has, has described what the aim of the, of the program is and some primary drivers that we think um will enable us to do that we, we've obviously got a very detailed driver diagram with secondary drivers and lots and lots of change ideas which i haven't shared with you today but you can see the, the methodology that we're deploying in order to try to um identify where are the best change ideas that we could test in order to be successful with this. And, and I've got three examples of that. Um, and again, the level of detail here is too much, but I think it's just useful to illustrate to you what, you know, the methodology that we're deploying in order to, to try to assess how we prioritise some of this work. So um, there's three areas that I've, I've got here. The, this one is health and wellbeing. So um, what does the descriptor say in terms of best practice, um, what are you doing at the moment and where are the, some of the opportunities for you to improve? And you can obviously at, at your leisure, you can have a read of these, but we've got one in the slide deck around health and well-being. I've put one in around flexible working and I've put one in around leadership and teamwork. And, you know, that that one in particular being something that we think is a significant area that can help with retention. So, um on a monthly basis, we will. Got about five will, minutes, Louise. Yeah, I'm nearly. I've got my last slide now, Andy. So month, monthly basis, we'll do this kind of highlight report up to the Trust Executive Committee, and then through to People Committee, and obviously to NHSI. Um, and we will be uh, be tracking progress against a number of deliverables as part of this. And you can see on that slide. Uh, uh, this is the, 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 the governance process that we've got in place in terms of our programmes of work and, and how that fits in terms of um, the trust governance structure and, and what, you, what you can expect as, as non-executives in terms of reports up to the People Committee. So I thought that was useful just to, to share that and to share the extent with which we are engaging across the organisations with colleagues as part of this programme of work. I'll finish there, Andy. I'll take Thanks. the slide down. Thanks, Louise. Obviously, a lot of detail there, but I think do take the time to to go through that. Uh, say it'll be on admin control. So, Shirley. Right, I'm not sure if you thought it was up there already, Louise, but I can't see those slides. Do you mean in admin control, Shirley? Yeah. 
Uh, we've, yeah. got, we, we've got yeah. 8.1, but we haven't got those slides. They are there, but you might just have to refresh your admin control. All right, super, I'll so. do that. Thank you, Louise. That was really, really comprehensive. One question, though, that you said, I think it's just over 2% who are leaving for better terms and conditions or reward package. Have you been able to identify what that might look like? Um, it's a really good question. And and actually, it, the, what I haven't talked about is cost of living and the concerns that we have around that. Um, and and in particular, our lower paid workers. So um, anecdotally, um, and I know that this will be in the data somewhere, I've heard some of these stories. Um, if you remember during the pandemic, we were able to attract quite a lot of people from the retail and service sector. Um, yeah. the airline sector and those um, non-registered roles at band two, three and four were quite attracted to people um, at a time when the, the, you know, the labour market w was not very buoyant. Um, actually, what we've seen is some of those people and, you know, one example I had was a maternity assistant um, finding less stressful and better paid jobs back in the service sector. And the retail sector in uh, Malayne is nodding their heads that she's heard this. This is not unfamiliar. Um, and actually what they're saying to us, well, I'm still going to carry on working bank for you because I really like being part of the team and I enjoy the work. But I can go and work. In this case, it was I can go and work at Heathrow in a service centre and get paid more and have less stress. So we do know that terms and conditions and and because of the cost of living issue, is going to drive some of people's decisions in a way that maybe previously it hadn't. And so we're working in particular, working with our system partners to make sure we're not, we're not out bidding each other for people, uh, but also thinking about how do we make the non-pay benefits of working in the NHS? How do we sell those? How do we make people, you know, see, see why you would want to come and do these jobs? Um, because it, to a certain extent, with some of these things, we're not going to be able to compete on pay. No. OK, thanks, Louise. Uh, so, uh, Lily. Just just a second. Uh, the, uh, the question I have is how much can we actually learn what our neighbouring organisations are doing well where we are not uh, performing as well as they are. Thank you, Lily. Uh, yeah, that's a great question as well. And certainly Michael Pantolin in his role as the people officer, P chief people officer for Surrey Heartland has um, played back to us some of the data from the staff survey and we've identified some areas where uh, uh, organisations are doing better than others and asked for examples of best practice. And we are quite good at sharing that. But I suppose for us, we are in a really privileged position to be one of those 23 um, pilot sites. And they chose us because they thought the work that we were doing around workforce transformation was quite impressive. But it does then give us access to some best practice you know, work and some support and feedback that, that other organisations won't have. So hopefully that would be a really useful bit for us, Lily. I think you turned your camera the other way, so we can't see you. Thanks, Lily. Yes, yeah, uh, so, sorry, it's on the phone. OK, thank you. Um, Julie. Thank you, Andy. Um, I, I just wanted to share my reflection. So clearly I have the benefit of coming from another acute trust and certainly the body of work that Louise has has just outlined, cre really from a starting at the top from that well-being offer is is really outstanding and clearly the, absolutely the right thing to do. But as an organisation, clearly Ashton and St Peter's have prioritised that and that's incredibly important. And that's really borne out in the demonstration of what's been delivered and has been so well received within the organisation, certainly when we're out and about and we see people using the wellbeing 
um, rest areas and enjoying lunch in the canteen. You know, it's really tangible and people are feeling it and feeling really supported through it. So I really just wanted to make that reflection um, having come here from from elsewhere. I think the people promise work, you know, again, is that's a real accolade to Louise and the team and uh, the organisation that to have been chosen in terms of taking that forward. And as Louise has said, that gives us additional data that we are being able, we're able to take forward and, and really sharing with our system colleagues. And uh, my last my last reflection really is the fundamental workforce uh, work that is being taken forward. Clearly, that that is going to be a brilliant foundation for all that change management and strategic development that we need to take forward. And as David's outlined, the work that we need to do, collaboration across the system, how we need to work differently, it goes hand in hand with the culture. So um, I, I feel that we're in a really strong position. And certainly, just my reflections on today, coming out of uh, a provider collaboration meeting. Um, Ashford and St Peter's was really driving forward the changes that we need to take forward, recognising there's going to be some really tricky and challenging discussions, but that this is how we are going to improve our patient outcomes and improve our offer for our patients. Um, so we are in a really strong position. So Louise, no questions from me, but I just really wanted to make that reflection. Thank you. Andrea? Thanks, Andy. It was just actually I just wanted to make a comment about the the, the uh, being a people promise exemplar site, which I think is is very very exciting. I have to say, um, and as of yesterday, the chief nurse of these twenty three sites have been asked to to be invited and get involved with this program with Ruth May's team to look specifically at nursing and midwifery around around all of these these domains. Um, and clearly, retention is key, but it does dovetail with um, the other piece of it. You know, we need to grow our own nurses, we need to attract more nurses going in to want to take up nursing midwifery as, as a career choice. The funding for international recruitment will 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 stop, um, you know, because it is very costly and uh, and that's been briefed to us. So there's a big focus now on really looking at growing our own. But I think this is a super programme and yeah, really, really exciting to see what, you know, what will come out of it at the end of the 12 months. So thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Melaine? Yeah, just to add really to that, that we've had a massive campaign at the University of Surrey in the last year to try and increase interest to adult nursing. Last year we had a bumper crop and we had 60% over our normal amount. That puts pressure on placements and I just want to say the Trust has done brilliant with those extra students. Um, this year we've seen a drop in applications. So I think it, it goes to, to David's uh, point really, you know, the goodwill and the love for healthcare has diminished a little bit in the last year. So we carry on campaigning and try and increase those numbers. Um, but I guess I just want to make another point that I know I'm a governor on this trust and I'm slightly biased, but student satisfaction in the organisation is high. And I've never closed a placement at Ashford and St Peter's. I can't say that about every other trust that we work with. So I would commend the work you're doing and I thank you for looking after our students. Thank you, Melaine. That's great feedback. Thank, thank you. you. And I think also it's, you know, it's not one big thing. It's lots of little things. Um, and I'm just thinking back last week when we all grabbed a trolley and went round and uh, distributed Jubilee cakes uh, and muffins and gluten free bars and indeed fruit following feedback uh, from our Ashford colleagues, um, you know, to, to people. And I would say 98% of the people that we were talking to were really, really grateful that we'd gone around to say thank you and to just di distribute something from from the trust. And those sometimes those little gestures mean a lot, re uh, really a lot. But I think uh, echoing David's point, this is a really hot labour market. We only have to look anywhere. You know, the the airlines are in trouble because of lack of labour that, you know, they will push their prices up. Um, you know, lorry drivers, you know, everywhere you look, you only have to walk down the high street. And I think every restaurant is saying, you know, we, we want servers, we want this, that and the other. So it's a very, very hot labour market. And so we have to be very smart, I think, in, in how we recruit and how we retain, particularly how we retain. So, you know, certainly the board is 
absolutely focused on anything that will help retention in particular uh, is, you know, really, really great value for money uh, and great value for our patients, of course. Any other questions for Louise? I think this is the first time, Louise, since I've been here that you've you've haven't had to hurry really, and you, you've had enough time uh, to to go through things, and you're not tail end Charlie either. No, uh, I so. can I can still fill the time though. So yes, um, Chris Howarth. Yeah, I, I put a question in the in the chat. Um, uh, I won't read it out, but it's it's really about pay. And um, maybe maybe we, maybe we could get a, a response over time. Doesn't necessarily have to be tonight, but um, I just wonder whether sometimes we're a little bit um, uh, utopian about people's attitude to pay. Okay, I think let's come back on that that one. Uh, I think because it's a very long subject, um, and but we are, as we said, we're really conscious of our lower paid colleagues and. You know, we're now seeing, you know, record petrol price jump in one day, you know, huge inflation as a result of the uh, the Ukrainian war and so on. Um, and, you know, food bank usage going up, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a really hot subject. Um, but let's come back to you on that one, uh, Chris. Sal, Sal, can you make sure we do that, please? Um, Andy Brown. Yeah, it's just a... a uh observation actually of the well-being hub at St Peter's it's really great but I've just noticed the last couple of times I've gone in there when I've been volunteering is a number of the cushions on the sofas the purple cushions have been removed um, I don't know why but uh, it just seems odd that if you're taking somebody in there it just looks a bit odd if you're trying to recruit somebody that the furniture doesn't look quite right oh gosh right well I was down there last week I didn't notice it but I will go again I mean obviously you know, part of the messaging is that this is staff, this is space for them, for, for our staff, and we expect them to look after it. Um, and, you know, they're adults, and we don't expect us to go in and tidy up after them like I do with my 12 year old. But um, I think, um, you know, we would, you know, there were also we expect there to be wear and tear, but you're absolutely right, Andy. We want it to, to continue to look as good as it did when it opened. So yeah. I, I'll go down and have a look. Yeah, it's physically the cushions have vanished. That's the thing. You know, it's not that they're placed wrongly. It's the back ones. The uprights at the back just have gone. So I don't know where. Okay. okay. We have we have got CCTV down there as well. So can have a look. Thank, thank you. you for that. OK, thank you, Louise, uh, for that marathon session. Hopefully, governors, uh, that's uh, given you a good view of where we are and all the things that are going on and that the you know the board and the exec team obviously in particular are right on this subject in terms of our people because it is our most most important asset of course um right in which case i'm now going to hand over to andrea for the cqc plan progress report Thanks, Andy. Um, so just to, I think the sort of the main headlines really are that um, this was all based, this action plan is all based on following an unannounced CQC inspection that we had back in November. It covered the 9th to the 11th of November last year. And the key headlines, I think, are that we're making some good progress actually against the, the actions and, and some are actually completed. And for those that aren't completed, you know, we do have the actions to 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 move those move those um, uh, in, in the right direction. And obviously we'll be doing further dates around this plan to the July quality of of care committee. So again, just to give the background, it was an announced inspection. As I said, it was looking at the services of medicine at St. Peter's and surgery covering both Ashford and St Peter's uh, sites. It was a focused inspection looking at the domains of well-led and uh, safe. And this was triggered by a considerable amount of whistleblows that we'd had from our theatres and anaesthetic uh, department over a period of what was 18 months to the CQC, covered various things about uh, around safety. Um, and behaviours within the department. Um, we had had an action plan around that to to improve the, the situation, but that didn't stem the whistleblow. So ultimately, the the rightly so, the CQC had to had to come in and and did so back in in November. The um, result of that. 
that inspection was that actually we went up in uh, three areas uh, and only went down in one. Um, and medicine, I think, uh, have to be commended because they went up from required improvement to good in the domain of safe um, and maintained their well led as good. And I think that's been a particular service that's had, you know, through COVID, have had some really big challenges with dealing with COVID patients. So actually to go up in the safe domain was quite incredible. And then surgery went up over Ashford um, from safe, uh, from requires improvement to good, and also went uh, improved from requires improvement to good in well led. And it was surgery that went down in the well led um, domain from um, was good, and that went to requires improvement. That ultimately um, resulted in both sites Ashford requires improvement, St Peter's requires improvement, but actually overall, with all of the services, the trust as a whole is still at good. So going to the actions then, that's just to give a bit of background, going to the actions, the actions that came out of that inspection back in November are broken down into three elements. There's the must do's that we were given and there was two and this is all in order to comply with our legal obligations around CQC regulation 12 which is about providing safe care and treatment. And then there was 13 should do's that the CQ, CQ, uh, CQC stated and then seven others that they felt that we should address. So just to go through those, I'll just pull out some of the key things. I mean, the must do's is the big ticket items. As I said, there was two and those were around our medical um, device uh, management in in theatres and particularly um, the servicing of those medical uh, devices. It was found to be incomplete when they came in and some were actually out of out of service for you know have been out of service for some time we have completed all of that now that servicing action uh, and that's that's all been done which is good and we've actually had an external company come in now to to look at our asset register not just for theatres and aesthetics but across the whole trust actually uh, to make sure that the structures that we've got in place are really robust and 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 good uh, and that's going that's being uh, followed up in the medical device committee that we we have on a quarterly basis um so there's been some really good progress around that uh, basically that's completed really and then the other bit of the must do was around our environmental and this they felt the CQC felt that the state of the walls the wear and tear of the floors walls uh, and fittings within theatres again uh, were not to the required standard that they should be and that was an IPC and effect prevention and control uh, was compromised as a consequence of that so there's been minor works and major works wrapped around this to to deal with it and this this is still ongoing the minor works, uh, there's been works done to the flooring in theatres, which is good, but there's still some uh, stuff to do with regards to walls uh, and some of the fittings. And then there's further major works programmes that we've got planned, which is around the sort of looking at the IPC perspective, the IPC refurbishment of our, particularly our St. The uh, Peter's theatres uh, and what we need to do around that. Um, but obviously that's that's for work that's at, at a later date. Um, so still still in play and, and Tom might be able to speak to this uh, later on if, if we wanted to. The should actions that we've had to to complete, I suppose really the themes around that, around the culture in theatres and Louise has already spoken to that. I mean, there's a big programme of work going on around the culture in, in theatres. And I have to say, you'll see that in the action plan um, and the whistleblowers have reduced. They haven't gone away completely but they have they have definitely reduced, which is good. So it does show that our, our engagement is 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 working. Um, obviously, we would want to eradicate it, but I think that's what's going to have to see for some of these programmes play through to to get there. Uh, pharmacy staffing was definitely uh, uh, brought out in in their um, actions, and we know that the staffing in pharmacy has been been tricky. They've been in business continuity actually for quite several months now because of their staffing. But there has been a recruitment and retention campaign wrapped around them. And actually quite a lot of their posts are going to be filled by the, the summer, which is which is good news. Mandatory training and safeguarding training again is the theme that comes out. Um, and, and I'm afraid that, you know, they weren't at the um, other services they looked at. They weren't at the percentages that they should be. But I think we I think it's fair to say because of Surrey Safe Care, you know that has been a challenge and that has been our focus to to for people to get through the training on Surrey Safe Care so that has taken a, a paramount seat um, but now we've come out of that it does give us an opportunity now with staff to be able to catch up on on um, on the mandatory training and there has been some improvement around safeguarding but we're, we're looking to maintain those gains as we go forward and this is all monitored through our safeguarding uh, uh, committee 
and we've also set up now a mandatory training uh, uh, working group as well uh, to look at that. And then staffing, uh, nurse staffing was brought up as well, and they they obviously the, the bit that CQC looked at it was within medicine is. Um, Obviously, what people what are what people were rostered to do, and actually the numbers that were out on the ground at the time didn't match. Well, there's a good reason for that, really. You know, we were heading into another COVID uh, wave. Sickness was still high then, um, and we were relying a lot on on temporary temporary staff. I have to say though that um, we did go back to the CQC to say we do have. Uh, a rigorous process around our staffing. We have uh, safe staffing huddles every morning to look at what the the numbers of staff we have, from particularly from a nursing uh, and midwifery perspective. We have our out on the ground uh, and where we can move staff in order to make it safe. So there is quite strict rigors around that, and they were content with that, which was good. And then there's the last bit I'll just pull out is around clinical practice, and they did pick up on uh, um, nutrition scores not not being done. That has improved now since they came in. We're at 94% of those of those assessments being being done for patients. NG tube management. Um, it, there was an alert that came out, national alert, and we weren't com completely compliant around that. We've we've made good progress on that to make sure that we are. And then. Um, Physiological observations not being done on time and not being completed on time was something they picked up, um, and, and we've completed that. We've we've uh, there was a big uh, focus to make sure that is is the case, and with the implement implementation, so we safe care that will help with that, um, and then bare below the elbows. It's a constant one, I'm afraid. Bare below the elbows again of of them going into areas and seeing people not complying with that. I mean, it, all I would say is that's constant messaging really from all of us uh, and the IPC team to make sure that staff are doing that. Um, so I think basically going back to the headlines really is that we you know we have made good progress on the actions. Uh, we have completed a lot of them. There's still uh, some that aren't fully completed, but we have got actions against that, and we will continually monitor this through the Quality of Care Committee. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Andy. If there's any questions, happy to take. Thanks, Andrea. Yes, I mean, Andrea makes the point. This is now, uh, you know, being monitored through quality quality committee, and uh, it. I think it's interesting to note that a lot of the whistleblowing was around theatres at Ashford, and when the CQC came in, uh, they judged those theatres all to have improved uh, to to good. Um, and yes, they picked up some things that rightly. Uh, in theatres in St Peter's, but the actual trigger uh, was um, was not what was uh, thought. So questions for Andrea around the quality of care uh, around the CQC action plan. Whilst people are thinking, I was, I was just going to add, um, we did challenge the report, you know, from the CQC when it came in. Um, and we challenged quite severely because the initial report when it came in, there was no mention of the fact we've been through a pandemic, which we found absolutely mm -hmm. flabbergasting. And uh, the CQC take, did take that on the chin, actually, um, and then reflected that within the uh, within the action plans. We did feed that up into the higher echelons of the CQC as well, because we felt we needed to, to say that for future, obviously, other yes. hospitals that were due to get inspected. So that was good. And it's fair to say the CQC are very active in the system at the moment. They're doing they're really doubling up on on inspections at the moment, catching up on inspections. So, you know, we could get we could get more. Uh, we could get another landing. Um, certainly, you know, colleagues across the system are, get, are certainly getting uh, inspected as we speak. OK, I think. I th oh, Derek. Derek. Yes, yeah, just when you thought it was safe, Andrew. Um, <laughs> <laughs> two, two quick questions, if I may, please. I think they, they would relate to you, but I'm sure you'll advise me if not. Um, at the last meeting, there was a lot of active discussion um, regarding the uh, amount of drop off time in the car parks. Um, mm -hmm. And I believe it was left that um, there would be a recommendation to um, the executives um, as to whether it would be around 40 minutes, which is what uh, us as governors um, we're putting forward for consideration and possibly 30 minutes or somewhere in between. Um, we, we've not had any update to that as yet. Um, and we were all um, emailed yesterday as governors to say that um, parking charges for staff would be being reintroduced. De 
Derek, you've gone on mute. You've cut off halfway through. Sorry, talk quicker. Um, it was around the um, amount of drop off time for uh, patients coming in. And um, I believe it was left that it was going to be put to the executives um, for somewhere between 30 to 40 minutes for consideration. Um, but as uh, 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 governors, we were emailed yesterday to say that uh, staff charging was going to be coming back in again. And I just wondered if there was any update on the actual drop off times been given as yet, please. Thanks, Derek. You were right that we did say we were putting that to the executive and we did indeed put it to the executive for uh, for consideration. D David? Yeah, no, we did have a good discussion about that. And I know Simon's on the call and um, we did feel that the, the issue always is not when you reduce charging, but who do you then put the charging on? Um, and there are lots of mechanisms for people who do have to have frequent visits to the hospital already. So on balance, and it, and it is very difficult, um, but in the current situation, we, we landed that we would keep that drop off time the same. Otherwise, it would just put the burden uh, too further over. And actually, Simon did go and benchmark us with any of the other people around. I mean, do you want to come in, Simon, and just talk about? I think you've made the points, David. And unfortunately, it's um, too significant a change and we were unable to find a way of of mitigating that, um, that in a in a more sensible way. Um, I, I, I get the I get the issue, but um, you know I'm not sure 40 minutes is drop off anymore. Is the is the kind of challenge on that as well? As I said, the financial impacts were were significant in doing that. Um, so we are at the moment at the 20 minute kind of limit, um, and as you say, there's a range of other measures. Uh, that are in place to sort of mitigate the impact of that on particularly hard hit individuals, really. Um, and obviously, they expand as uh, you know. For example, disabled access is 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 free now, uh, which it didn't used to be. So, so there's a number of other changes which will help support that, but not um, not answer directly the question of can it be expanded to 30 or 40 minutes. Unfortunately. So I think the point. Derek was that it was actively considered and in detail um, and the non-executives followed up on that. Um, but as Simon and David have articulated it, it's quite complex, much more complex than I thought it was, I have to say. Um, and when you put it in the context of what we're going to discuss in the closed board around the finances, uh, then it becomes even starker. So, uh, but Derek, top marks then on a very customs mm based intervention, i.e. just when we thought we were through, the customs official pounces. <laughs> <laughs> well, how many years never ever make assumptions. <laughs> never ever make assumptions, Andy, ever. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, perhaps a secondary quick one for, for Ange as well, if I may, please. Um, also, that was discussed briefly. Um, from looking back through some past papers, um, Suzanne, um, back in December 19, had uh, stated that she was going to introduce um, a three months trial for body worn cameras, uh, specifically um, for the security staff at, down at St Peter's um, and for A&E at Ashford. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to, to be aware of the news this morning um, regarding the increasing levels of verbal and physical threats to pharmacists as an overspill from various other areas including gps i don't know whether or not um it would be worthwhile considering mm. whether or not this would be an ideal opportunity to perhaps make staff feel not only safer but somewhat mm. more cared for um given the ri rising frustration levels of yeah. patients and, and good, others i think we've it's got a good point. answer for this uh, and yeah. louise uh, well Fox louise is, i'll himself. hand over to louise yeah definitely <laughs> yeah so um we um I still have the body ward cameras in, in place, so we converted that from a pilot to a permanent arrangement. Um, we actually had an incident this week in, uh, in our emergency department, and, um, uh, and that prompted me to think about um, whether we were still deploying the body ward cameras as much as we did when we first brought it in. We haven't done a lot of publicity about it recently, so we'll probably need to do that. 
but we certainly have got that available, not just for our security teams, but also some of the teams within the areas where we have seen incidents. So the emergency department is one example, but also ITU is another uh, another part of the organisation that was struggling with um, family members and, and behaviours. And obviously the visiting restrictions have just recently been lifted. So again, we'll be conscious of more footfall in the organisation and you know the potential for that to increase the incidence. Um, but it is something that um, that is part of of, of the programme of work that we're doing around staff experience as well. Um, to make sure that people feel that they are trained into how to deal with issues when they arise and that they've got, you know, the, the relevant support. Maybe we'll bring that back to a future council meeting at some point in terms of just the progress of, of that as an initiative. I think what would be interesting um, from board perspective as well would be the impact. So from the time we have pilot, you know, have, yeah. have the number yeah. of incidents dropped, you know, have, have they been making the right impact? Would be yeah, interesting. And it's difficult, difficult to look at data because obviously we've had COVID when yeah. members of the public in particular have been restricted in terms of numbers. But we can have a look at that, Andy, and certainly that was what we were measuring at the beginning. Because yes. the actual methodology of the body worn camera is that when it's activated, it has a front facing screen. So it's like a mirror. So what you hope is that it's there to diffuse the situation as much as to record evidence. And that's, you know, the purpose of using it is that you deploy the camera and then the person who's getting quite angry or agitated or physical then would see themselves in that. And that that in itself could be a diffuser, but it's also a way of recording evidence if you need it. But yes, we, we can do that. Thank you. Good, good question, Derek. Thank you. Derek, anything yes. else? Uh just briefly to round off on that, um, I, I, I say that from personal experience, having to attend um, A and E at St Peter's about three weeks ago, uh, and and by the time I once I'd got there, it was approximately two or two and a half hours waiting, which immediately jumped to about three and a half, and then rose to about five, and I have to say I was full of admiration for the staff on duty that were coming out into the uh, patient waiting area because as the, the queues increased, um, uh, tempers were becoming more and more frayed as frustrations um, increased considerably. And on occasion when the poor individuals are coming out on their own in, into quite a hostile environment as it started to, to, to uh, morph into, um, I would have been much happier uh, if I'd been on duty as one of the staff there to at least have had something there um, to talk to people about, because when you're something like about four hours behind um, and people, for whatever reason, um, are running out of patience, um, I'm afraid the goodwill very quickly evaporates. And when people are just coming out um, to bring someone in or to perhaps give an update, um, people do start to perhaps say things that they wouldn't ordinarily do so. But the stress that, that the staff are under, and more importantly, on a continuing basis, um, that level of stress is not healthy for anyone. Thanks, Derek. I think that's a good point. point. We, we certainly need to take it away now that the there's more visitors, more footfall in the hospital. Are we have we gone back to actually wearing them? I think that was a good point, Andrea, that you made. Um, OK, thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on now to any other business. I haven't been notified of anything. Anybody's got any for this part of the meeting? No, in which case the next open meeting will be on Wednesday the 7th of September uh, between four and six. And so we can, we haven't got a separate link. We normally have a separate link for closed, uh, but I, a quick squiz down says there's no members of the public on this. 